Yeah. Where did you get your tapes and, and, and about what year did you start to discover those tapes? Uh, I got my tapes from everywhere. You know I mean? Anywhere on the internet that sold them. And I found a couple people and I had a, a couple friends actually in New York who tape traded. Uh, and I started about late 95, early 96. Mm. I started, you know, seeing the whole different world of wrestling and, uh, yeah, man, I, it was because of ECW that, oh, wow. that all happened. Because I got into ECW because of a friend told me, hey, you like wrestling. And at the time, I was a big Bret Hart guy. And, you know, Bret was, I think, losing or lost or something. One of the two. And uh, I was like, yeah, I'm not watching anymore. It's getting too cartoonish or whatever. And he put it on ECW. I was about 13, 12, 13, 14. And uh, at that age, every boy wants violence and yes, whatever gets them going. You know what I mean? And ECW had that in spades. And uh, guys like Raven, I grew up around guys like Raven. I, Dreamer being from Yonkers. I know guys like Dreamer. I know guys like New Jack. Every, everything just spoke to me as, yeah. a, as a teenage kid. Found that. And then because of that, I found uh, RF video. I don't know if we're allowed to say that. Yeah, yeah. I know it's live, but you know, yeah, whatever. We are. And uh, our video, I remember buying a best of Japan 1995. And I only got it because I knew of Chono and Muda from WCW. Okay. I didn't know anybody else. So I just bought it because of that. And then that's when I saw Kawada and Kobashi go 60 in Osaka. And I went, who's the guy in the yellow? Who's the guy in the orange? I had to go back to their website and had it all mm -hmm. lined up. And that was it. That was the beginning of my love affair with uh, All Japan Pro Wrestling. I went back, studied stuff, found out about Ricky Dozan, him training Anoki and uh, Baba and all that stuff. I think it's interesting that, you know, where Vince made a living with these over the top personas and characters, you know, like The Undertaker or even the visual of a Yokozuna or whatever in, in all Japan, you know, it just came down to a color scheme. Hey, this is the black and yellow guy. This is the green and white guy. This is the orange guy. There was consistency there from a branding standpoint. I know those are buzzwords people weren't using back then, but it was easy to identify. Okay. Yeah. The orange guy, that's Kobashi, the black and yellow guy. That's Kawada. Like you knew, even if you didn't really speak Japanese, you could, you can still keep up and, and, and follow it. And fighting is a universal language. Yeah, no. That, it, I tell everybody I'm not in the pro wrestling business. I'm in the uh, emotion business. That's our yeah. jobs. You know what I mean? And that's what they did. They brought out the emotion of, of their fans every time. I'll never forget watching uh, a tag match, one of the great tag matches with Kawada and Tawe against Kobashi and Masawa, I believe. I think that was in 95 as well. And Kobashi covering Masawa while Masawa was getting stomped by Tawe and Kawada and hearing women scream, scream as Kobashi's getting beat up, saving his friend. It was just, that's emotion. This uh, this match that we're watching, do you know what building this is in? Do you recognize that one? Uh, I think it's Budokan. Most yeah. of their big main events were in uh, Budokan. That's why, you know what I mean? Uh, when I had, you know, when I did the G1, how crazy is that for me to say that in a sentence? Mm -hmm. uh, fucking insane. When I did the uh, G1, everybody was asking me about, you know, aren't, you know, you want to do the Tokyo Dome? Yeah, of course. And <clears throat> I love doing Sumo Hall, but I kept telling God, the guys too, if I get to do Budokan, it's a wrap. Mm -hmm. Like I'll retire right after. <laughs> There's nothing going to be higher than that. Mm. You know what I mean? So Budokan is where all Japan had a lot of their main events sold it out. It was their home. The Budokan was all Japan's home and new Japan's home was uh sumo hall. Eddie, when you think about your career and you think about when you started just trading tapes and, and learning about uh, wrestling in Japan and you think about wrestling at G1, it's like, right? Yeah, it's, an, yeah. it's it doesn't uh, it seem real. Yeah, you know what I mean. And and I feel like 
how did it happen sometimes? Right. You know what I mean? Sure. And then there's days legit. People think I'm nuts, but there's days where I'm like, this can't be real. I'm going to fall asleep and I'm going to wake up at 19 again. Yeah. Waking up at five in the morning to do my iron working job yeah. and hopefully getting out in time so I can take a bus to Pennsylvania and start training. Yeah. Yeah. I'm like that too. Some days I close my eyes and I'm thinking, oh, it's 1980 again and I'll not get married. <laughs> I was waiting. I was waiting. <laughs> then I was my, waiting. Then and that my, clothesline, like I tell people, this match, you don't need to know the Easter eggs, but that clothesline that Kobashi just did yeah. is a tribute to Giant Baba. It's, uh, it was Giant Baba's finisher oh. back in the day. Wow. The neck drop. Neck drop clothesline. Yeah. Just, no, like, this, here's what make, one of the things that makes this match so great. And I know there's selling involved. I get that, but it doesn't seem that way. Yeah, yeah. You know, it, it just they they're just so good at what they do. Hey, I'm like we're watching a real fight. Yes. Here, here comes your half and half. Boom. Yeah. Uh, this was also the era of uh, some people call it the head drop era because mm -hmm. they had to up the ante on the moves because uh -huh. they wrestled each other so many times. Right. All four guys, and then when Akiyama came in, uh, they had to up the ante. And uh, now knowing what we know, what happened to a lot of these guys, like even Kawada said to me, he goes, if you want to do our style, you'll have a short career. Mm -hmm. Wow! And I told him, yeah, man, let's do it. <laughs> I was like, yeah, okay. I know the price, you know what I mean? But... Yeah, it's a rough, it's a rough wear and tear on your body, and they did it all for the sport and for the, for their company. Eddie, have you ever heard that the, uh, the fact that Japanese people have more neck injuries than any other, uh, people? You is that, that is that for real? Yeah, like uh, outside of wrestling too. You're saying, Tony? Yeah, yes, so, right. Well, uh, my, here, it, oh, here comes the tiger. Okay, I, uh, it, it may have changed, but in 1995 when I had my neck surgery. Uh, my surgeon, who was at that time one of the top surgeons in Atlanta, said that all the surgeons, uh, the top surgeons, go to Japan and study. And I said, why is that? He said, because Japanese people have uh, predominantly a smaller sack of spinal fluid around their spine. Oh, wow. Uh, a thinner, a th and they have more neck injuries in Japan than any, any place else in the world. I didn't know that. Well, yeah. you can fool me with these guys going at it. I know, I know. But maybe that's, you know, and again, I guess everybody gets dropped on their neck or their head. They're going to have a short career, but wow, look at that. Great timing. 